Um, I'm Mike Tarno. I've uh, written this paper kind of with um, Lei Jacques, who's done most of the heavy lifting. I'm just going to talk about it. Um, uh, but I'm an de application developer at the ADS. Um, and, uh, basically, today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the background to some of the NLP work that we're doing, um, uh, some of the work we've done in the past, uh, talk a bit about the Ariadne project, which is what a lot of the current NLP work we're doing is, is being funded under. Um, the work we've done to date for that, um, show you guys some evaluation of some of the NLP we've done, and then um, show the web application. I should say NLP is a natural language processing as well, if you don't know um, what it is. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the Archaeology Data Service uh, was set up in 1996. We're a digital archive uh, based at the University of York. Um, our remit support research, learning, and teaching of high quality and dependable digital resources. Uh, basically means we preserve data, disseminate data, and provide guidance uh, and um, advice uh, for data creators. Um, what most of you will know us as is uh, a website. Uh, this is just the kind of tip of the iceberg of what the AES does. Uh, behind that, there's a whole preservation system using OIS model, uh, management systems to manage the data, uh, deep storage, inline storage, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, so, uh, but one element, one of the most visible elements, obviously, is our kind of website, our dissemination outputs. Uh, but there's a lot more behind that. Um, but to kind of go into the um, NLP work that we uh, are undertaking, I'll give a bit of a background of kind of where we uh, or, or what position we're in right now. Um, we have a lot of unstructured data, uh, which is also known as text. Um, basically, we're talking about uh, great literature reports, journal articles. Um, we have about 30,000 great literature reports in our great lit library at the moment. Uh, we've got hundreds, if not thousands, of, of journals, um, article journals from uh, archaeological societies, national bodies, um, and, and other groups. Um, and the problem with all this unstructured data is, is sometimes it's hard to uh, discover this stuff or find out what you've got. Um, the kind of typical approach that you use when searching for or trying to recover uh, information from uh, unstructured data is, is uh, simple lexical uh, matching or string matching. Uh, you have a, it's a bag of words approach. So you think of each document as a bag of words. You try to figure out does this string exist in this bag of words, and if it does, you Get a result back. Um, there's obviously issues with that. The English language, um, as I'm sure many other languages are like that, uh, there's problems with synonymy and polysemy, which is uh, s uh, words having similar meanings or uh, words having slightly different meanings. Um, and so it's sometimes hard to recover or discover what you're trying to figure out uh, from a, um, uh, a simple uh, search. Um, what would help this is if we had really good metadata, and unfortunately, um, for some of our collections and deposits, it's, it's impossible to get, particularly when it comes to resource discovery, which is what we're interested in here. We want to allow users to figure out if this document is going to be useful to them in the research. Um, so until we get a, a, another way of, of producing uh, metadata or uh, we get uh, really, really rich metadata deposited to us, um, we're going to have to look at, at different approaches. And, and one of those is NLP, or Natural Language Processing. Um, and the first uh, foray of the ADS into NLP work was through the Archeo Tools project. Um, it was a project that went from 2007 to 2009 uh, between ourselves and uh, the NLP research group at the University of Sheffield, um, proper computer scientists, and they focused just on NLP uh, stuff and developing NLP tools. Um, basically, had a very ambitious uh, uh, um, agenda. Um, indexing uh, millions of records that we have, producing NLP tools to extract all sorts of metadata from uh, these unstructured uh, documents, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was very, very ambitious and uh, didn't really produce the results that we would have, we would have liked. Uh, I think one of the things that we discovered from this process was that, um, uh, well, other than kind of realistic expectations, was that uh, NLP for perfectly representing a, a, a document is, is impossible at this point to, with current technologies. Um, it's very, very hard to, to take, teach a machine to try to figure out uh, how to understand syntax and information within unstructured data. Um, it was, uh, we, we, the, there were some useful things out of there. We, we have some of our, our interface uh, tools. Uh, the faceted classification from Mark Search was a product of this. So there were some successes, and, and we did learn a lot of things from this project. Um, but uh, we did get some, some useful tools that we had from this, this uh, exercise, 
that we are using today uh, and going forward with our NLP work. Um, some of the modules within this, these NLP, uh, NLP tools, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but it was, um, uh, yeah, overall it was, it was, it was very interesting and useful, useful exercise, but, um, but we were slightly, uh, slightly disappointed, I'd say, um, with, with what we were, we were hoping to get. <laughs> Um, the next uh, kind of jump into NLP is now through the Ari Agni project. Um, this is a big European project, 24 partners, 16 EU countries. There's a few fellow partners in the audience. Uh, um, it's got a, a somewhat ambiguous uh, objective uh, to bring together and integrate existing archaeological data infrastructures and researchers, so researchers can use the data sets and new technologies as an integral component of their work. Uh, which sounds a bit wishy-washy and, and kind of hard to pin down, but actually it's developing some really useful tools, in my opinion, uh, trying to index uh, data sets that exist in different uh, European catalogs and, and, and data, data repositories, um, trying to come up with vocabularies and mapping vocabularies between uh, different European languages and so on. Um, but it's, it's very interesting, probably lots of, lots of interesting stuff coming out of it. It's about halfway through. Um, do visit the website, uh, ariadne-infrastructure.eu, um, and I'll give more information about what, what we're trying to do. Um, but the ADS involvement in this project is, uh, we're involved in a few different elements of this, but the one that we're, uh, I'm going to focus on today is obviously NLP stuff. Uh, the NLP work is being done uh, by us, uh, University of Leiden in the Netherlands, and uh, University of South Wales in, uh, in, in Wales. Um, and there's going to be some, some, um, some of the, uh, 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 some of the reports that are coming out. I've just put this URL up at the, the resources tab, which is going to have some of the, the, the reports that are being produced, and there's one coming out soon for the NLP uh, work we've done. Uh, but to kind of give you a kind of brief overview of, of NLP, for those of you who don't know, um, there's two main techniques that people use when trying to use NLP. One's a, a rule-based approach, uh, which basically is you create a list of rules, um, and then you uh, create a program that runs through text and actions uh, or, or executes certain actions based on these rules. Um, so it extracts entities or identifies entities as being certain parts of speech or certain types of, of, uh, of, um, of language or, or um, terms that you want to identify. Um, the other approach is machine learning, uh, and that is basically taking training material and pumping that through a program and teaching a machine how to identify different kind of classes of entities uh, that, that you're interested in. Um, there's a lot of things that go underneath there. There's, there's effective, I, I just think of them as libraries, but they're, they're kind of tasks in the, uh, in the, the process uh, that have to do with part of speech reasoning and, um, or processing and um, tokenization. So part of speech, identifying where verbs are, what's a verb, what's a noun, what's an adverb, what's a pronoun. Um, and then the tokenization is just identifying where, where words begin and end, which you think would be easy if there's a space, it's probably a new word, but that's not always the case. Um, so that's all done by linguists and NLP uh, experts. Uh, that sits on a lower level, and then on top of that, you kind of build in the domain-specific uh, uh, kind of uh, expertise, and that's where this training material comes in, and then the machine should learn how archaeologists think and then be able to process it uh, later. Uh, the pros and cons to both, um, obviously with machine learning you need to create a lot of training material so that you can teach these machines or these programs. Um, rule based, you have, to, you have to create rules uh, you know, for every possible instance, um, which can sometimes be, be difficult. But um, uh, one advantage of the, um, of the, the machine learning uh, we think is that uh, you, can, you can hopefully have underlying tasks of those libraries I talked about that uh, might be for different languages that, that can be useful for um, uh, understanding other languages. Because this is a European project, we do have to um, try to work with the other languages, not just English. Uh, so that's going to be one of the objectives that we have within this project. Um, but we're doing the, uh, we're taking the mach machine learning approach, uh, the ADS. Uh, University of South Wales is, is doing a rule-based uh, approach. NLP. Um, if you're interested in learning more about rule base, uh, you can talk to Andreas Vlachidis uh, from the University of South Wales, who's, who's leading on that uh, uh, from there. Um, but from, from our side, I'll just go over kind of how we do it. Um, basically, uh, you produce a bunch of training data, and that's a, on the left a, um, the program that was used uh, to annotate text. So we just took a bunch of great literature documents, uh, had our domain experts, which were the ADS uh, staff members, uh, tag the documents with what were subjects, what were temporal, what were place names, um, I think we did title, and a few other kind of elements. Stuff that we wanted to, 
to kind of extract from gray literature in general. Um, so you do that, uh, and then uh, you basically uh, put it through what's known as a classifier, which I'll talk in a second. Uh, and the classifier kind of uh, does all the heavy lifting of trying to figure out, trying to learn, understand how this domain uh, uses parts of speech and, and kind of constructs its senses and then be able to identify where these classes will exist, the subject classes, the temporal classes, the place names. Um, for this project, we, uh, we used, uh, for, with, well, we originally did this exercise in the Archive Tools project, so that was in 2008, 2009, when we, when we did the, the training. Um, we did about, was about 30 great literature documents between the ADS staff members, so there was some overlap between uh, each kind of staff member, so we could pit the results against each other and figure out who was better at, at uh, reading great literature documents. Um, then that was about, I think, about 225,000 words is what, what, we, what we, we read collectively. There was about 5,000 annotations created out of that. Um, and that was basically pumped through one of the classifiers, and then that was what was, what was used to, to kind of develop the, the tool. We're using that same training data. It's very, very long and intensive process. You imagine sitting and reading the documents. If you're reading it through normally, you just kind of scan and you, you make all these uh, uh, judgments and decisions on the fly in your head. Um, doing it explicitly was, was, was tedious. Um, that's a representation of Stuart Jeffrey doing it uh, there. Anyone knows Stuart? Uh, it's about what he looked like when he was undertaking this work. Um, so that, that training data is pumped into the classifier. There's two, there's two types of classifiers that we were evaluating. One's a linear support vector machine, or SVM for short, and the other one's conditional random field. Um, this is the real NLP stuff. You'll have to talk to Lay to, to learn more about this. But um, it's basically the two different, they, they, these two different approaches. Uh, some are the same. There's exact token string matching. So it's kind of see, do, do it have these tokens or, or words in this, in this text? And it learns what, what those are. Um, one's looking at the root of words or the root of a token and then trying to learn from that. Um, both using uh, gazetteer lookups. Um, you have to talk to Lay to learn more about this. I'm not, I'm not really familiar with this. But uh, we, did, we did take this the CRF approach. Um, we didn't have, there are kind of benchmarks that you can use to judge these. Um, we didn't have any because you, you need to do, uh, have something called the gold standard that you can judge it against so you can tell whether uh, you're getting good precision or good recall in your, um, in your processing. Uh, we didn't have that so we just kind of asked archaeologists, does this look like it gave good results or does this one look like it gave good results? Um, from that highly scientific method we decided the CRF was, was better. And uh, we can't really say much more than that. Uh, it was also actually we thought the CRF was was more useful because it was going to be easier to integrate into other applications later, which is going to be a big big part of this project. Um, and it's and it was uh, a, a less uh, computationally intensive, um, so we can do it on the fly a bit easier than, than using the SVM approach. So basically, you have all that training data, you pump it through the classifier, and then you should have a model or a system that can that can organize uh, text. So you can theoretically just throw random text now at uh, this NLP tool and then extract entities from there. Um, so there's, we, we created a web interface, uh, a web application for this. This is internal and, and you can tell by the design. It was designed by uh, developers, not by designers. Um, it's functional, it just works. Uh, we'll, we'll tart it up a bit when we, when we release it live. But it uh, basically allows you to input text uh, and then the NLP tools are, are run on that text and entities are extracted. Um, you can also upload uh, documents, so we can upload Word documents or PDFs. Um, that was slightly more problematic because we have to convert all those documents into plain text. So there's a lot of conversion artifacts when, you, when you're converting from PDF, especially, and sometimes from doc, uh, Word documents. So um, it's much better to cut and paste after this kind of stuff. So um, if we do it in, in other methods, we, we sometimes have to expect that we're going to get some, uh, some questionable results from these uh, conversion artifacts. Um, just an example. <laughs> Excuse me. Just an example. Uh, I just took some random text from the uh, uh, from the Gray Lit Library, one of the, the front pages, the landing pages for the Gray Lit Library, um, and uh, just pasted it in. Um, ran it, and it, you can see it returned on the on the right side there. It detected some grid references. That actually doesn't use NLP. I should say um, I, it just does plain string matching or regular expression matching. It's it's uh, it's a so the, the, the grid references are pretty consistent, so we can just uh, identify those that way. Um, however, the entities which are below it, um, these three, the subject, the temporal, the place name, those are the three that we're really interested in, particularly the ADS in, in terms of our uh, providing resource discovery uh, metadata. 
uh, people want to know what, when, and where uh, things existed, and, or, and, and what, what uh, kind of resources have those. Um, so this, just from this basic, uh, basic kind of text, you see there's porch, cart shed, farmstead, settlement, farmyard. I mean, they're all archaeological terms, but whether are they useful? I don't know. It's, it's, it kind of depends on uh, what kind of research you are. Uh, the temporal was a bit more successful, I think, and the temporal generally we found to be more effective. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure why, but you can you can see it picks out all the century, but it picks out qualifiers of those centuries. So when it sees an early before a century, it knows that that was part of the of the the, the token or the entity that it should take. Um, and also, like 1284, there at the bottom, that, that's a year, and that is actually a year in the text, not just a number that's in the text. Um, obviously, there's, there could be four digit numbers or three digit numbers uh, in the text elsewhere. Um, the other interesting thing is they it picked out the, um, the place name of Countess Ware, which is actually a place name in this instance, but could obviously be uh, a person's name or, or describing a, a subject. So um, it does, it, it, that's all part of the, the, the underlying tools that are understanding the part of speech and, and, and how these things are constructed. Um, so then, just for this, or for, for one of the reports we did, um, we just took a random uh, Gray Lit report. Um, I can I have it in my notes, but I can't see my notes here because I didn't get this set up properly, but um, uh, I can tell you which one was later. Um, we put the whole report through, I can't remember how many, it was about, I think it was about 15 pages. A standard Gray Lit report, just, just one of the typical ones, nothing kind of particularly fancy. Um, and uh, what the tool really wants to do, because we're talking about great literature, there's a few things we want to get out of it. And um, some of the things we want to get out of it, uh, because we don't always get it, is uh, grid refs, uh, where, so where this event happens, we want to be able to, to place this event, or where this, uh, this event ha occurred. Uh, the authors of it, which actually you think would be a very easy thing to do, but actually can be quite difficult, and isn't always given to us, because we just get a big dump of PDFs and it doesn't say, uh, so I'm going to have to go in and actually read them all to figure out who, who wrote them. Um, and then titles as well. Titles, it, it, other than a file name sometimes, we, we do just get um, uh, uh, just uh, no information whatsoever. So obviously within the OASIS system, which a lot of regret comes from, uh, this, this isn't the case. But we're talking about kind of instances where we have legacy data or data that, that wasn't collected through OASIS. Um, so it, it, interestingly, it, it picked out seven titles, which all actually were the title, the Imperial College Sports Ground, Simpson Lane, Arlington, London Borough. Uh, of Hilding, Hilling, Hillingdon, archaeological excavation was the actual title. It picked out quite a few, uh, I, and, and those, I, I have to go back to that, that document why I did. Um, all those grid references, those were the only grid references in that, and it did pick them out successfully. Question is, are those grid references related to the event, or are those grid references related to something else that's talking about? We, we're not entirely sure, so um, this is one of the shortcomings of the grid ref, uh, because we're just using regular expression, we don't, we don't necessarily know. Um, but then the other ones that it talked about, the four subjects uh, and uh, place names and temporal stuff. Um, the subject it picked out 144 entities, I think it was. And on the left side, some of the, the successful ones, in my opinion, that, that would have been potentially difficult. Uh, Peterborough Ware Pottery, which obviously has a place name in it, but it could identify that it was, a, it was actually a subject. Um, settlement enclosure, which is kind of combining two concepts, in my opinion, so I thought that was interesting. Re rectangular ditched ritual enclosure, uh, aerial ph photographs. Uh, Alice Holt Industry, which I thought that was an erroneous one, but evidently uh, that is a genuine uh, uh, archaeological uh, subject, so uh, I was impressed by that. Um, and then uh, Tegula, which is the polarization of Tegula, which uh, it was able to identify. Um, some of the problematic ones that are a bit questionable, walled vessels, I think there was probably a word before that that it, was, it, was, it missed out on, thin walled vessels or something like that. Uh, sheep, you know, that's, uh, I don't know how useful that is archaeologically, but it's, I mean, it is, <coughs> If it was about sheep uh, remains, that's useful, but if it's talking about sheep dip, I don't, that, that's two very different things that it didn't quite uh, identify. Charred weed seeds, um, that just makes you wonder what they're actually doing there. Um, backed knife, I, I, it, probably something was before that that it didn't get. And then we're all set on the straddles again. It's just, it just kind of missed out on a few. But I mean, those, those are the ones out of the 144 that picked out that uh, I thought were problematic, and I think it did pretty good otherwise. Um, 144 entities returned, though, is quite a bit, and it does require a bit of sifting, so we're still working on how you, how you present that um, based on frequency. So there's an issue with frequency, because there's some terms that are used a lot, like the ones I didn't show, pit, um, ditch, stuff like that, feature a lot, so you think would be high up, but actually they're not as interesting when we're trying to discover what this, what this report's about. Uh, temporal, 
a bit more successful, I thought. Um, some of those ones, uh, you can see it's got date range of BC on the right, uh, date range of AD on the left. Uh, post Deverell Rimbury, again, I'm not familiar with this, but this is actually a, a pottery um, type. Show. I'm coming from the computer science mathematics background, so I'm not familiar with some of the archaeological, some of the archaeological terms. Um, early Viralium, Viralium. Uh, again, later Saxon instead of just late Saxon, so it's it's picking up those those terms that are that's a qualifier that is actually significant. It's not just doing that string matching. Um, but then some of the problematic ones for for Bronze Age first Mesolithic communities clearly clearly missed out on that. So. Um, and then place names, uh, there's lots of place names, and these, these are quite effective, uh, um, picking out place names that are from a very local, I'm talking about a farm or a place that you know, you'd know you find in an OS uh, reference, all the way to regions, West London, East Anglia. Uh, but then it did pick up some, the Peterborough Ware clearly is subject, but it, it, it picked up Peterborough, Peterborough Ware pottery as a subject, correctly, but Peterborough Ware as a place name, and, and that's, I'm sure we could, we could tweak that and, and remove that kind of stuff. And Imperial College, I think, was actually a place in this, in this instance, it's talking about uh, where it happened, that it, it, it becomes ambiguous. I'd, I'd have to check up, I guess because the title is, is how Imperial, does have Imperial College is talking about it, I think it's probably um, okay. So finally, I'll talk about the, uh, the future work that we're hoping uh, to do with this. Um, uh, one of those is going to be Oasis integration, so in the re, re, uh, rebuild of the, redevelopment of the Oasis project, um, which we're hoping to undertake, we're kind of in the planning processes now. Um, we're looking at potentially running this as you upload a great literature form. So we can have your uh, depositor um, uh, specified metadata that you load up or enter into the form, and then also run uh, the NLP on and try to extract some of these entities that will be richer than what they'll, they'll include on this. Um, some of the, uh, them GUI improvements, because what we do want to do is we want to open this up to everyone. We don't necessarily want to just keep this to ourselves. Um, we, we want to open this uh, GUI up for other people to use so you guys can upload documents and get um, uh, XML or JSON uh, uh, exports out of it so it can give you a list of what the entities that the NLP tools identified. Um, we can talk if you guys are interested in that kind of stuff, come talk to me because uh, we don't really know how people might want this, so we'll just kind of make assumptions and it might not be uh, the right one. So if you come and talk to us, we can kind of uh, steer us a bit that way. Um, talking about doing AIP, uh, it's our API as well, uh, so we can, uh, you could actually integrate this into your own services, so you just ping a, a, a text <coughs> and we just send you back uh, uh, XML or JSON, so you don't have to actually manually use that, um, that interface. Um, and then we've also kind of thought about crowdsourced crowdsource annotation tool. I talked about all that training material, requires human annotators to sit there, tag documents and say this is a subject, this is a place, and this is temporal. Um, we're talking about, we, we've started creating that a bit, that's what that screenshot is, it shows uh, a term being tagged and it's being annotated as a, I think, a place. Um, and uh, uh, opening up that for other people to contribute into improving the NLP uh, as well. Uh, but other than goodwill, we don't really have anything uh, to offer you. Uh, like money, <laughs> so you just have to be uh, hopefully out of the kindness of your heart to do that. But those are all stuff we're hopefully going to be doing. That's the plan, and we're we're looking at uh, uh, undertaking these within our government. And that's it. Thank you very much.